Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome, welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Jeff Lerner, your host with you as always, and today I'm joined by two ladies. I've never actually interviewed two people at once before, so um, we're going to see if it's total chaos or if it's just more the merrier. We'll, uh, we'll work our way through. Anyway, excited to be here with you. Appreciate everyone tuning in, and uh, let me introduce our guests today. We have Kim Doyle and Jody Hirsch, and they actually have different backgrounds. I've also never introduced two people at once before, so <laughs> we'll, we'll tackle that. But uh, Kim is formerly known as the WordPress chick, yep. um, entrepreneur, coach, podcaster, content creator, um, really smart lady. And I'm not saying that because she wrote it on her bio. I'm saying that because I independently researched and verified it. Um, and then Jody is a, and I love this term, a smartest. Uh, and I think she's even wearing a shirt. I am wearing yes. a shirt. That's awesome. Smartest. Uh, I love it. And she... Uh, has owns a design company, Orange Star Design, and um, also a pet band, pet brand called Live Love Dogs, which is positively fetching swag. Pause and fetch. You worked that into one, uh, one I statement. Know. I love it. Anyway, <laughs> Kim and Jody, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. Ooh. We didn't plan that even. Wow. Even. <laughs> wow. Yeah, right. I think we Damn. started doing this enough. That was funny. <laughs> I love it. Um, Here we go. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you, I mean, a lot we could talk about. I mean, Kim, between your experience with web design and, and really like almost like whole platform promotion of the WordPress ecosystem and, and which I know a fair amount about. And then Jody, obviously running a, an agency and a design company. I owned an agency for six years. So like, there's so much we could riff on here. Uh, what I want to ultimately get to, it doesn't mean we have to start there, but where I think we're going to want to get to is what you guys are doing together, which is the content creators planner. Mm -hmm. Because for myself and my audience, most of my audience is going to, you know, have context on this. For myself, I've gone from zero to what feels like light speed in the last two years with content creation, distribution, strat, you know, the, everything related to content, right? So, and I did all that without a planner. So <laughs> I can only imagine how wonderful of a tool that really is. And, and I, I started to poke around on it on the website and it, and it looks very, very cool. Um, but maybe we can back up. So, Again, I have so many questions, but I want to I want to probably start with like how did you guys realize that this content creation uh lack of planner was a problem and an opportunity what brought you together and ultimately to get this thing to to market? I'm going to start Jody with this. Sure. Yeah, you go ahead. And then we'll, we'll kind of segue cuz there's like a little bit of two part. Um I had been switching to content to get into my personal brand from the WordPress chick. And I have always been a pen and paper. So is Jody. I owned a scrapbook store like way back in like 1998. So I love pens. Long story short, I had bought a bullet journal. It was a little bit too structured. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that system, but the bullet journal, he's got this whole, you know, create an index for the year and you number your pages and stuff. And I was like, Oh, this is way too much for me. But I, I fell in love with the journal itself and the actual quality of the paper. I love the dot grid matrix. And I started just color it, coloring, but I would map out like a funnel one day. And the next day I was like, what do I want my life to look like? Right. So I was just kind of playing around, but I tested, I took pictures of it and I posted three photos as Instagram stories. And only one of them did I use the hashtag journaling. The two that I did not got like 50 views. The journaling hashtag got like 
over 500 views and they were three boom, 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 right after the other. And it just kind of hit me. Like I always went to pen and paper when I was planning stuff out. And so when I fell into this sort of journaling hole, I was like, this is huge. It's like a subculture of people that do journaling and they, there's YouTube channels and they map out their spreads and all this stuff. Long story short, I was like, I think this would be a really good idea. And uh, <laughs> I reached out to Jody. You can take it from here, Jody. <laughs> Yeah. And before I tell that part of the story, I just want to add something that just came to me. You know, so, so Kim was really focused on a planner from the story that she just told from the journaling aspect and she likes pen and paper and all of that. And I think when, when she brought me the idea, I think what, aside from liking Kim and wanting to do this with her, I, I never really thought about this before, Kim, but I crave systems I always joke around that most of my clients bring me chaos and my job is to create order out of it. And I think that's why I like the concept of planning so much, even though I'm kind of a terrible planner, I'm just constantly trying to create order from chaos. But um, so Kim and I had met online maybe seven, eight years ago, and I heard her on a podcast. We connected on social, chatted several times. Back in the days of Skype, we Skyped with each other and we just became friends. And um, summer of 2018, she reached out to me with this planner idea and asked if, if I could help her. Did I know InDesign? She was looking for somebody to create the physical planner. I'm like, well, yeah, I know InDesign. I, I can help you with that. And she asked me to partner with her. I'm no dummy. So I said yes. <laughs> and we started working on it. And within just Gosh, I think we started on at the end of August mm -hmm. and we attempted a Kickstarter, <laughs> our famously failed Kickstarter. That I thought would be a brilliant idea in December to launch a Kickstarter, but go ahead. <laughs> and that didn't work out so good. <laughs> so we, we knew we weren't going to get funded. So we pivoted, put together a WooCommerce WordPress site and managed to get most of our Kickstarter backers to bought purchase a pre-sale through our websites so we were able to recapture most of that and started shipping planners in march and that was when and we it, first met each other by the way in person oh, that's right <laughs> we'd never met in person we were already in business together and we met in baggage claim in st louis <laughs> <laughs> and and that's march of this year 2019 2019 2019 okay so and we're recording this in september of 2020 so 18 months, basically. Yeah, well, from idea, we've been at it this two years now. From idea to today, it's been two years. But selling, yeah, yeah not to be. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's Nip -nip good it, because I, I want people to hear that. Like, this is the power of the internet. You've gone mm -hmm. from idea, not only idea to, you know, serving the market, but idea to failed launch to successful launch Yep. to you know, growth phase now in, in less, really less than two years. Mm -hmm. And a an couple of important life lessons along the way. Life threw us some really, really nasty stuff in 2019. Mm -hmm. And we just kept going as best we could. Mm. You know, when, when Kim was out of commission with some personal stuff happening, I, I was shipping planners. Boy, I was shipping a lot of planners. <laughs> was a lot. And, you know, I, I went through some stuff kind of around the, the same time. And, you know, Kim just had to, you know, carry on. And we just, you know, we're not perfect, consistent, imperfect action as, as we just keep going. And I think that's the key is you just keep going mm -hmm. and having a good partner, of course. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I went through some, some real crap in 2019, too. And I'm just going to recognize the three of us that we got our crap out of the way in 2019 <laughs> and the rest of the world kind of waited till 2020 to go. We've been training for 2020 our whole lives. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of a whole uh, probably other interesting conversation, but I mean, has your business been negatively affected, positively affected or neutrally unaffected by, you know, the craziness of 2020 in particular, obviously COVID. You know, I, I'll, I, it'll be interesting to hear both opinions on this, to see two sides of it. You know, initially 
to start with, I'm going to back up a little bit. Like we made a commitment when we launched this to Jeff that we were going to go into paid traffic right away. Obviously we're content creators. We believe in content marketing, but we also knew that to give this the chance we wanted, we were going to put paid traffic behind it. So like, and we didn't take money. I want everybody to hear this for till just last September. So we ran this and just kept putting it back in, kept putting it back in. Um, we scaled pretty, then we hired an ad agency last fall. We scaled from like, I don't know, 6,000 November to like four to over 40,000. And we scaled higher. And there were just that, some- That was after we had, we started that on our own with the yes. ads. Yeah, we ran ads for our, by ourselves for what, May, June, July, August, March, six, seven months. Um, and so we then terminated that agreement with the first ad agency, brought in a second ad agency right as COVID was kicking in. And so we definitely saw a hit, um, but it's, it, there's, there's, it's kind of like running an ad, right? You don't split test a thousand variables. And we had a thousand variables thrown at us at once with, mm -hmm. with COVID, with a new ad agency, with audiences. And, and it was, so it's, I would say it, it impacted us at the same time. You know, we have since decided to take the ads back because truly like our best ads were the ones we created because we know our audience, we know who the problem we're solving, we know the purpose behind the planner. Um, and so we're getting ready to ramp up for, you know, the remainder of the year now. So I would say it did, but there's so many factors. I don't know to what degree, honestly, because I content creation and online courses and market, it's just going to start scaling now, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I would have said Similarly, I think it's impacted us. I mean, we definitely saw a dip, but there's so many variables, so we can't necessarily attribute it to COVID, but um, I'm sure it has impacted us. Like some Facebook ad behavior was crazy volatile mm -hmm. yeah. for a while, and I'm sure that was COVID-related, market-related, which of course is COVID-related. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I think, like Kim was saying, there's, there's so many variables. I think we kind of wore out one audience mm -hmm. and I think changing agencies like we did, there was a good reason for doing it. But I think, you know, one of the learning experiences for me is when it's just the two of us doing stuff and I'm not advocating that you do absolutely everything yourself, but when it is just the two of us, we're very agile and we can react and take quick action. And I think mm -hmm. that that's very necessary in with entrepreneurship ads too <laughs> yeah and, and with ads but you know for for very small businesses like we cannot wait three weeks to a month for a piece of creative like just freaking do it right. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and you know that's uh, to me that that's just a bit you know part of the learning process along the way but it's it's hard to know but it probably has impacted us yeah there's Man, there's so much in what you guys said to, to unpack because I just relate to so much of what you said from personal experience. Um, my guess, without hearing your answer, was going to be that COVID had a snap and then a snap back effect, which would be because I know in my business, for example, the initial fear and uncertainty of COVID um, led to just a retraction of spending in general. Everybody just got really scared and conservative. For like, I went to Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, and they were trying to find toilet paper, and it was just different things on their mind. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys as uh, planners strike me as way too high quality and expensive to use for either kindling or toilet paper. Um, we would hope so. <laughs> but uh, but but at the same cuts. time, once the dust started to settle after let's say two to six weeks, and people realize, wait, this isn't just some like anomaly. This is kind of a new normal, at least for a while. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I think that I got to think the realization is like, yeah, oh, that whole content marketing thing or that whole e-commerce thing or that whole digital business uh, concept that I've been putting off as a business owner or, or a, a publisher or an info marketer or an influencer or whatever. Yeah, I can't really put that off anymore because there literally are no physical people to sell to. <laughs> so I got to get my game together. And then if they're me, then they, they spent a year doing content really inefficiently and really, and I realize it hasn't been a year since COVID, but to my point, like you're either going to get really organized from the outset or you're going to realize what a big project and process content marketing really is. Mm -hmm. And then realize, man, I need a plan and I need some tools. 
Yeah. So, so I got to think the long-term net probably is going to be good for you guys. I think so. I think so too. And, and we've definitely got some supporting products and things around the actual planner. And, you know, one of the things that we have done, I would say a, a, quite a bit is like, we'll hop on calls with customers and stuff because the thing is, Jeff, like we took a whole, what was it? Like, I always tell the story, six hours on a Zoom call on a Saturday one day. And we really dove into story brand and who is our customer and what is the problem we're solving and all of that. And we, so we were so clear on that. And then who started buying the planner though? Like we had our target audiences, which bought the planner, but I mean, we've got people buying the planner who run social media for, you know, a local city government or a chiropractor or a dentist or a school or a church. And it's like, you know, so all of a sudden we realize there's a bunch of verticals to your point that people are going, oh, I think we need to start paying attention to the internet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that's kind of a, now let's try some vertical marketing. <laughs> So one of the other things that jumped out at me in your, in your uh, you know, little narrative about the, the experience is the idea of running your own ads, then trying, and really just in general, the concept of like delegation, but specifically around ads, you, you, you gave and you took back um, and you realized, you know, and you're still sort of describing a tension between if you want something done right, do it yourself. And also if you want to scale your business, you can't do everything yourself. Right. Right. Like, ah, what do I do with that? And so I'm, I'm curious um, where you guys, God, there's like eight questions I could ask, but probably the one I want to ask is, okay, so you're at, and, and if you're comfortable with numbers, are you, are you comfortable like saying how much you're selling right now? And if no, I can ask it in a more general way. Well, I'll tell you, we just, we shut our ads off like three weeks ago. So we're not really selling right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. We so were yeah, averaging, I mean, the, we went from, the, Go ahead. Wanna, are you cool with numbers, Jody? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like January, we hit 67,000, and then it's just started dropping 40, well, and they were. But we, it was about a $30,000 ad spend, and it, yes. re, the return was about 67,000. Okay. Yeah. You that know, so, January. and it just kind of started dropping and dropping and dropping. And I think our lowest month was probably, I don't know, what do you think, Jody? Like, 27? Well, we had a couple, we had a month or two where, you know, it was kind of a break even on the ads, but mm -hmm. even when we're breaking even on the ads, so maybe we spent 30,000 and we made 30,000 return on the ads. And of course there's cost of goods and stuff, but a lot of our products are digital. So there really right. is no cost. Um, even when the ads are breaking, even we're still acquiring new customers and then we sell them additional things through the back end. So we look at that as a win. Obviously I would prefer to make 67 on 30, but yeah you know, it just wasn't always the case. So the unfortunate thing is, is we don't necessarily know why. We don't know if it was COVID related. We don't know if it was the approach that the, the newer agency was taking. And, you know, we've learned a lot through this mm -hmm. process and we, we can get back to numbers. But at the time that we hired the first agency, after we had successfully tested and come up with some winning ads, we didn't know how to successfully scale that. So, you know, we were spending $100 a day ourselves. And we were all and, like, woo! <laughs> and, it, you know, every time we tried, you know, there's strategies to doing it well. Right. We just didn't really know what we were doing. And every time we were trying, like, we were trying to split test things and things kept turning off and <laughs> what in the world is happening? So we hired some help and they scaled us up to, I think at our peak, maybe $1,500 a day, which mm -hmm. I just never thought. I would ever say something like that. Yeah. And it was amazing to learn how to do that and to, to gain the confidence to operate like that. And it was interesting when we switched agencies to see the difference in the approach. And I think like we lean more towards the first agency's approach, just not necessarily the Their quality of creative. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's a tough thing. Like you want it, you want it done right, but you want it done by somebody else. <laughs> and you want it done quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I think this so, is such a it's tough. Yeah. I mean, and again, I feel, I feel both your pain and your, and your, you know, enthusiasm at the same time. Um, I think this is such a cool conversation for my audience to hear because effectively you guys are running a startup only you're not, you're not newbies at all. I mean, mm -hmm. Jody, you've, had an agency for 20 plus years and Kim, you've been a, you know, a content creator and 
authority and, and, and web, I don't know what you technically did with WordPress. If you're a web designer or you unintentionally, I did websites, but it was, yeah, but I it did. was mostly to teach about and monetize the platform in general yeah. from yeah. what I understand. And so, you know, with that breadth of experience between the two of you, it's like, yeah, you're learning some lessons, but you're also accelerating through a lot of the normal growth and, and learning curve that would be associated associated with like launching this brand new thing from scratch. Right. Yeah. Right. Can I, is it okay if I swear it's, I'm not going to drop the F bomb? No, it's, it's, or yeah. That's it's usually, fine. that's my job. <laughs> okay. Well I do, but I just, I want to be respectful of your audience. We have this running joke now. We're like, this shit works. This shit works. Like, I don't know why it's taken me so long. I've gotten a little bit obsessed with copywriting. Right. And, and like when we had our initial follow-up sequences, we wrote it. So we had them, we had one upsell and I'll tell you, our biggest problem is just like, probably lack of time. And I have more time than Jody. Her agency is really full. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's really seeing and mastering that, okay, so if we redo our follow-up sequences, make them better, wow, we can increase automated sales on the back end or testing like we launched an official newsletter, right? And it's like, we make money every time we send the newsletter. Right. So you start looking at all these little things and nuances where would be so hard for somebody just starting like I keep, I'm preaching now. If you can learn one skill, it's learn copywriting and understand what gets people to buy and all of that because it literally, we're seeing results all the time. And it's like, we know this stuff, but it's being able to implement it and deploy it and, and test mm -hmm. it and tweak it, you know? Well, it's kind of funny too, is because there's two of us, it's like, we both know this stuff. We know what we're supposed to be doing, but mm -hmm. we're human too. So we all have our own forms of resistance, yeah. you know, the things that we don't want to do and stuff. And we push each other, not necessarily intentionally, but I've gotten Kim like a little more <laughs> focused and organized. And I didn't really do it on purpose, just, but she says things like she quotes me, like I'm some kind of an authority on productivity, which <laughs> I'm well, not, she but. But one of her sayings is, what would easy look like? So I always tell myself, I'm like, why am I making this difficult? Why am I making this difficult? Right. What, would Joe, what would Jody say? Not what would Jesus say? Right. So, so, you know, she does what, what I've suggested she, she should do. And then it works. And she's like, this shit works. And then in return, like, Kim's really transparent and shares a lot of herself, herself and her personal story and journey through her content. So she might be teaching you how to write good headlines, but she's going to tell you a story about something she experienced mm -hmm. along the way. It's just how she, how she moves through the world and it's great and it works. And I'm a little less like that. I mean, I'll tell a story. I just don't put as much of myself into the story. And recently I'm going to tell the consistent yeah. creative yeah. story. Okay. So it was my turn to do, we alternate who does our weekly newsletter. And I wrote an article that's, that's in the blog. That was the main story of the newsletter about how to become a more consistent creator. Cause it's one of the things that we hear from people that is mm -hmm. so hard. So I write this nice post, got a lot of feedback on the post. And then I was that weekend. So the newsletter goes out on Sunday. So I wrote the post like on Friday. So that weekend I thought, well, I'll, I'll just write some sort of an intro and send this out to my personal orange star, Jody Hirsch contacts. Cause I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> so I sit down to do it. And I discovered the irony that I had not emailed my personal list in 221 days. <laughs> And I just wrote the authority be post consistent. on becoming a consistent content creator. So, you know, I owned it and I told my story and I sent it out to my list and, you know, it did fine. But Kim convinced me to tell that story in a separate email to the content creators list. Mm -hmm. And I thought she'd lost her mind. I'm like, really? <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. It was kind of all about me. She's like, no, send it. Like, it's all about me. I need to pack it with some kind of value and educate them on something. She's like, no, send it. I'm like, okay. So I sent it and oh my God, this shit works. <laughs> you know? I had, I don't know, 20 something people from content creators planner then visited my personal site as a result and signed up for early notification of a course that I'm working on, which mm. I wasn't expecting that. So, you know, we might know what we're doing, but <laughs> we're also still learning constantly. Well, we're still human. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so to your point, the, the main, the main shit that works is doing a lot of shit, knowing that some of it's going to work. Right. Uh, first yeah. of all. And then obviously you get better at knowing 
you know, which shit to which, focus which on. things to do. Yeah. yeah exactly. But, but, um, but no, I mean, that's, that's the, the biggest thing. Cause like, it, what, what would the alternative have been to you not sending that story to that list or, or the alternative to you sending that story to that list? It would have I would been, have done, I would have not done it. Exactly. At the all. alternative yeah. it wasn't like you had a better thing waiting in the wings. Mm-hmm. You're like, Oh, should I do this? Well, if you don't, then you're probably going to just put it off another three weeks. Mm-hmm. So just mm-hmm. go with what you have. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and it was good. It was, that's what was funny. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you think that if you have trepidation about mm-hmm. exposing it, it, my experience is it's probably the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know from, I know even it, for my content, the scarier it is to talk about the more insecure, anxious I, I feel around sharing it, or the more I'm worried that it's going to be too transparent and display my lack of competence or expertise. Mm-hmm. It's always the best stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know the, the author, Stephen Pressfield says he talks a lot about fear and resistance in his books. Right. On, um, and you're going to feel, you're going to encounter resistance and you're going to feel fear. It's part of the creative process for everybody. I don't care how successful you are. We all encounter it. And there's always that moment in every, Thing where you're like, oh my God, I have this great idea. I'm working on it, working on it. Oh yeah, this is great. Oh my God, this is shit. <laughs> it's just part of the process. And you push through it and then it turns out really good and or pretty good and you put it out there and something happens. And to just know that it's part of the process and do it anyway, you know, you can kind of laugh about it most of the time like we are mm-hmm. right now. But, you know, it's fear and resistance. They become your familiar friends you're like oh hello again (laughs) and wouldn't it be great if every time we published we were flooded with eyes and ears or views or whatever but it's not the case there's so much out there i feel like it's safer to just do it anyway (laughs) today yeah Yeah, it is it's kind of like when you walk into a party and you think everybody's talking about you and really like they don't even they don't even know (laughs) you're there when did you get here (laughs) yeah it's that's how content is in my experience i mean especially Mm -hmm. when you start yeah. Um, you know, you'll have like, you'll, you'll do a live or something. And two weeks later, it's like 17 people have seen it. And even that number sounds like, oh, 17 people saw it. But that's like 17 people that clicked on it. And after half a second, they were like, yeah, let's see what else is on the feed. I mean, it's like the total engagement time of those 17 people could be like 41 seconds, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, and you're so stressed about it. So so I have two questions. I mean, this content planner supposes that it's got an, a, a consistent content creator using it. It doesn't do much good if somebody's not actually doing that. Right. And so I'm curious, you know, the best, uh, and I don't know your business model exactly, but I got to imagine the best, certainly the best way for you to get good testimonials and good, good word of mouth in the market is to not just sell people a planner that sounds like a good idea, but actually either sell it to people that you already know are really, really prolific content creators or sell it with some sort of guidance or inspiration or something to actually get people to do it. Because frankly, mm-hmm. the hardest thing about creating content is to get momentum and get the, the, the critical mass of volume and flow. And then you have the problem of being disorganized and needing a plan. Mm-hmm. But you know, you have some people that like, they're getting ready to get ready and they buy the planner and they may fill out the whole planner, but they like never actually do it. So I'm cu- So what do you, and you wrote an article about being a consistent content creator. Like what is, how do you, and, and I'm asking selfishly because I have tons of students that struggle with this. Mm-hmm. How do mm-hmm. you get people to turn that corner and start doing it? Well, I think a couple of distinctions and then I know that I know what Kim's <laughs> answer is going to be. So I'll be brief. <laughs> I don't know. There's creating strategic content there's creating consistent content and then there's creating a lot of content or prolific Ooh. content. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to be prolific and create a ton of content. I'm not saying don't do that because there's value in that. But if you're strategic, if you're creating the right content for the right reasons that is addressing the, the right audience, so t- helping them solve a problem, identifying their problem, providing them with a solution, making sure it's connected to an offer or some entry point into your funnel to a product that you're selling tied to some back end 
upsells and other activity. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, you know, that's enough. And if you wrote three really strong pieces of content and sent paid traffic to that, and, and you might be promoted good for them months. with a ton of micro content and had lead gen attached to it. It's like, you know, that, that could it. be enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then on the, cons on the consistent part, you get to decide what your schedule is. Like, you know, Kim pointed out my agency is really like overloaded right now. So I, I'm really strapped and stretched thin. So once a month, once a week, once every two weeks, whatever you can commit to, as long as you're on a regular schedule so that people can count on that schedule, like Ann Hanley's um, Anarchy Fort, newsletter. Fortnightly, is that it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Fortnightly newsletter. She sends it every other yeah. week, not every week, and it's mm -hmm. fantastic. And you know, I, I, I mean, I don't have another example, but if you don't have time to be producing a ton of original content or even like monthly original content, do what Kim and I are doing right now. Be a guest on somebody else's show. This is content also. Mm -hmm. All we had to do was show up and talk. I so there's, there's lots of ways to be strategic and consistent. It don't necessarily have to be extremely prolific. So that, that's my point and I'm sticking yeah, to that, it. That was, <laughs> that was really, really insightful for me because I've been through all three of those phases. Mm -hmm. You know, when I decided I'm doing this, I'm going from unknown to known, whatever it takes. Uh, I started with prolific and I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I shot like seven videos my first day, like mm -hmm. I'm going to build a library and just, and then I was like, wait a minute, it's not enough just to shoot videos or, or write articles or whatever. You got to have a, a strike. There's a lot, there's going to be a lot more value in it. You get a lot more bang for the buck. If you have a strategy, if you produce it or engineer it or, or, you know, whatever, yeah. have, have some sort of intention behind it or even, mm -hmm stitch the pieces together so that they, they, they tell a story over time and they start to define a brand over time and not just hodgepodge of, Hey, I'm here at the grocery store. Hey, I'm here at the gym. Hey, I'm here picking up my kids. Like who is Those this are, guy? Right. Right. Well, and even that though, you have to think context. What are you publishing where, right? Those make right. great Instagram, Facebook stories. People love the behind the scenes, but the other thing, like, cause I have, you know, we use this hashtag, everything is content. Like I started practicing, like, how could I turn any story into a piece of content that then with a the call to action, I did it with emails a few years ago. But the one thing I want to point out is like to support Jody's point, you see a lot of people on Facebook right now advertising, you know, 365 days of content pre-planned and buy all my templates and do all this and do that. Can you imagine if you had planned out your content for the year in January oh, yeah. this year? Yeah, I, I, I just chuckle when I see those offers for exactly. You just change the date on those posts to 2023. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And the thing is, I think if you come back to, you create content, obviously we have a business that we want to grow. We create content, it's marketing, but at the same time, your content should serve your audience, not you. So all of this bullshit of go create a ton of videos and push them and push them. And, and first of all, that that's too much to follow up with regarding engagement. If you're not engaging with the content you're producing, yeah, like you're not creating relationships. Like it is really like, it's so old. I feel, I feel like I'm like an 80 year old man right now, but I'm like, go back to like core direct response marketing principles. What works in business is relationship and, and consistency and value and all of those things. And so content is not about like, great. If we could all be Gary Vee and have 20, five people producing daily for us. That's one thing. But I think it overwhelms people. Like they get like, I cannot produce like that. It's not who I am. And so whenever I work with somebody, I'm like, well, what do you enjoy doing? You don't have to do everything. Start with what you're good at, get it working, measure it, and then step into something else. And, and a lot of it too, I think is people have this idea because they've heard it and they've heard, you know, Gary Vee has got them convinced of it or whatever that like, I need to start creating content. My business needs content. I'm, I'm obscure and irrelevant if I'm not, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times I think you have to look at your business and say, what is my business? For, two questions. There's like an inductive and a deductive. It's like, first of all, what does my business need from content? What, is it, what do, does my business need mm -hmm. content to do, to do? And then secondly, what, would it, what opportunities would a good content strategy create for my business that maybe don't even currently exist because let's say currently your entire business was set up to service local customers 
Mm -hmm. But now through content marketing, you could be servicing more geographically spread out customers. So like you might, it might even be that like, don't just dive into content, but actually modify your business so that it can actually benefit from content. Because as it stands now, it may not, content may not serve it or vice versa. Like there's mm -hmm. this yin and yang component to it, I, I think. And, and so again, <laughs> kind of to my, my, my previous question, like you guys are selling this tool, right? Like you're selling, you know, I, I, well, it's yeah, really it's a, a it's a framework for content. Okay, okay, strategy. yeah, that that's good. But it's like to me, it's like selling. Like I sign up for these apps that are like, you know, your ninety day workout plan or something, right? Mm -hmm. But like, you still need somebody to teach you, and even like do a little therapy or at least consulting <laughs> on you to yeah. get you to be the person that will actually use the tool. How much of that do you guys do, and if so, how do you do it? Well, a couple, so we have a master class that people can get and it's at like 47 bucks. And so we're actually going to be launching a continuity to, to, and the point of the continuity is that we're going to deliver a, a how to, in essence, like it's, it's uh, a piece of content that we're going to show you how to do it. We're going to teach you how to do it. We're, if there's, so there's a framework for the content that we're going to say, do this this month. And then you get us live that month as well in a private group, because that's just it. So many people like another thing we're uh, pulling together is like an accelerator where we literally hold their hands and take them through the planner and we do it live with them. And it's a group coaching kind of thing, you know? So th the truth is we have not had <laughs> the time or the bandwidth, yeah. you know, to, to deploy this, you know, and it's, and it's interesting. And I want to just add this, right? So we're, there, there are other things though, because there's a, a, a free Facebook group for, for content creators and Kim more than I is, is very active in the group. I'm, I'm starting to be more active there. And we also, you know, it's, it's funny, our, our customer service mentality is yes, <laughs> just <laughs> Yep. Just well, yeah. whatever they want. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we answer the chat support and the support emails ourselves. It's just the two of us. And we go out of our way to make everything right. Even if the person's wrong, we just make everything Even if you're right. trying to ship physical products during COVID to Australia and it takes two yeah. months. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like we, we ran into a, lot of, a lot of shipping problems. We just, yes, we just mm -hmm. made everything as right as we can. And as a result, the unexpected thing that happened, because this was not calculated, um, is as many great testimonials as we get about the product, we get just as many ab about our service. And sometimes when people get on the support chat or email asking, uh, telling us they're confused or they're overwhelmed, they don't know where to start, there always seems to be confusion around goals. Sometimes we just offer to zoom with them and we get on zoom and we just help them through it. Kim occasionally does live work with me sessions in the group and people watch her plan something out and she's done hot seats with people, helping them create a content plan while other people watch. So while we're more structured solutions are about to be launched, you know, we just all along we've, just kind of have been are, helping people. Are you monetizing any of that, call it back end support and coaching currently? Not right now, but that's coming. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Go, go ahead, Jody. What were you well, saying? I was going to say, we've each gotten a few private coaching, yeah. consulting gigs out of it, but we just chose not to do that through well, the content it, planner business. I mean, so my, you know, applying my experience to what you're describing and if yours is different, I'd love to hear about it. Cause you know, my, my ultimate goal here is for our audience to get this perspective. It doesn't have to be my perspective, just a, a perspective that's relevant and useful for them to apply to what they want to do. So, uh, but my experience would tell me, okay, so you're shipping a planner that has physical cost and you know, you're running Facebook, you were running Facebook ads. And you're selling a product that has a particular challenge of being something that's only valuable insofar as the person actually really, really uses it. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a piece of workout equipment or something, right? right. Um, so there's a lot of potential value. In fact, ju probably just as much value in what you could put behind the product to help people implement it as the product itself. But that's also exhausting and expensive and a slippery slope 
Mm -hmm. if you don't get paid for it. And essentially you're paying to acquire customers that as you acquire more of them, you're both incrementally and in aggregate depleting yourself and making yourself less efficient because you now have more of them to support and you're actually getting paid less and less per unit for that support. So, so exactly. I would think like you can't keep doing that for free. Well, no, and, and here's the thing. I, this is why, so there's a couple points here. One, the continuity, we wanted to do it from day one. But okay. again, like 2019 was hellacious for us. And obviously this year is random, but it's not been personally as challenging. Um, but that being said, you know, like we were not about to just throw a membership out there and just start doing, we were like, this really has to be as value driven. It has to work into our lifestyles. Like this point in our lives, neither of us want to be live in Facebook groups three and four times a week. It's, I don't want to do that. Right. You know, I don't mind doing it, but I don't want to do it. And we, we looked by looking at the numbers, like we had a, a, it was a former mentor of mine from a mastermind. And he's like, you know, I think we could sell a high ticket version of what you're doing. He didn't quite grasp, I think, that the space that we're in. And we're like, we had already talked about doing this content marketing accelerator where it's like, look, we'll take you through this, but we have to be able to do it on a decent scale group wise. And so it took us to this point. And even the continuity, we were like, what can we deliver that provides massive value? People still want Kim and Jody though, right? So we have to make right. sure there's that touch. And so, so it took us two years to say, we've got this now. We know what this looks like. We're ready to deploy it. But even that, like, because it's the two of us, you know, we, we break tasks up and whatnot, but we waited truly Jeff until we were like, this is super valuable. We can keep this up. We can deliver, you know, enough of a high, high touch that people feel like it's worth the money. Mm -hmm. And you need, and you like to your point, you know, to do those kind of programs, whether it's a continuity membership or, you know, a high, higher ticket coaching or accelerator track or something, you do need like a critical mass. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't sell a continuity program with one member right. and, and have it be nearly as valuable as it will be when there's a hundred. So mm -hmm. I told, that makes perfect sense to me. And, and what I hope people are hearing is that like, even really, really good marketers and, you know, publishers and technologists and whatever you guys, however you define your skills and, and, and talents, um, st it still takes time to do these businesses right and do them well. And, and for my audience, I have a lot of people that, especially since COVID, where like they're looking at the internet, whether they admit it or not, they're kind of looking at it like a, like a Band-Aid or, mm -hmm. or, or a parachute maybe. Yeah. And it's like, that's a really bad lens to look at digital marketing through because it's still real business. There's still mm -hmm. phases. It still takes time. And usually urgency is is kind of the enemy of doing it right amen totally people yeah. jump into it thinking that it's a get rich quick thing i yeah it's the strangest thing and then because there's so much um that they don't know about the space they have perceptions about value and cost and all of these things you know and it's like when i said i owned a physical scrapbook store right like way back in 1998 well, we had rent and lease before we opened the doors. Right. But yet, for some reason, people don't want to pay rent or leases or cam charges when it comes to the internet. Everything's supposed to be free. Oh. It's a really weird dynamic. They don't even want to pay for hosting. Sometimes. Right, yeah. right. And it's like, well, you know, bye. You know, and you look at it like I always, I, I kind of equate it like how many offline businesses in the past six months wish to God they had had an email list of their customers yeah. that they had a relationship with that they communicated with regularly. I'll never forget going to a restaurant. I was in the Bay area and it was like a bocce ball place. And, and it was really cool. It's this Italian bocce ball thing. And with my girlfriends, the owner comes up to us. He was a little drunk, but he's like, Oh, you know, hi ladies. How's your dinner? And I was like, you know, you should have an email thing on your site. I hate those on websites. And I was like, okay, you're, you have a customer saying, I'd like to be able to give you my name and email so I could hear from you. <laughs> right. And now but, he's closed. And yeah, now he's closed. <laughs> yeah. And, and rent, you know, if he's in the Bay Area, he was mm -hmm. uh, not cheap on his rent. Right. There's nowhere you could be in the Bay Area and not be paying a lot for rent. Why do you uh, think I'm in Boise? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in St. George, Utah. So yeah, I have the same. Uh, it's probably comparable to Boise. It's great. But um, okay. So, so question... Again, I have so many questions. I know I'm not going to be able to fit them all in to the time we have, so I just have to make peace with that. But um, I'm curious, what, 
allocation of your total customer base, would you say are like agencies or what we would call either agencies or mature like influencers who have like a sophisticated and consistent content creation process for themselves or, or clients, as opposed to either startups or small businesses who are like, Hey, I know I need to do this. And before I'm going to do it, I want to get organized. What's your split. You think? Well, we haven't done a cert. We're going to survey our list. Um, but God, we just started a segmenting survey on our opt-in for yeah. Okay. Whatever, whatever that opt-in is. I can't remember what it is right now. Yeah. But I, I don't know. What would you say, Jody? Like I would say 50, 60% are, are people are, who are in marketing and understand it. I mean, we were really, I was, I was very surprised with how many people from like outside of the digital marketing space have our customers. Yeah. I think though the ones that are actually in the marketing space, I think they're very small businesses. It's like, you know, one or two people that are providing client services and also using it for themselves. I don't really know if we've broken into larger agencies. I, yeah. I know there's been a few that bought several to give to clients. I don't mm -hmm. know that they're using them <laughs> was, for their they're own probably. Clients. I mean, if it's a bigger agency, they're probably buying it and then trying to rip it off and claim it as their own and use it as part of their service model. We haven't which, had that happen sucks, yet. But but, but well, not we that we had, know of <laughs> that we know of. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, we've had like a couple brokers have reached out. Would you do a training for our brokerage? I think I could get, you know, this many people. One guy didn't get back to me, but you know, he, he wanted to know, could I buy 75 planners for, for both yeah. of our offices and whatnot? And so I, it's like, we really hit a, a pain point here. And again, that's where it's like, so that's one of the first markets we want to test verticals. What about running to realtors and, and mm -hmm. creating a content plan and whatnot? So I don't, you know, I don't know that we have those numbers to be honest. Um, you know, I will say I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an endorsement, even though I haven't used your product, I'm going to just conceptually endorse it for my audience and say, listen, if you're in my world, if you're a fan of this show, then you know, content marketing works because that's how you met me. Or even if you met me through a paid ad, it was likely my content, my base of content that made you go, Hey, out of all the you know, online quote guru types. Like I like and trust this guy because there's more to it than just an ad. And that was my content. So, you know, content marketing works if you're, if you're here. So the mistake that I made, I don't know that it was a mistake. It was just uh, unnecessary difficulty was I started doing content. I was ignorance on fire and I didn't have a plan and I didn't have an assembly line and I didn't even really have a comprehensive understanding of what it meant to like take a piece of content out to market and the difference uh, in best practices between Instagram stories, Instagram feed posts, Facebook stories, Facebook page posts, Facebook personal posts, mm -hmm. YouTube videos, IGTV videos, like, you know, TikTok video. If you even, I don't even mess with TikTok because it's like a whole other way of thinking about content. It's just, <laughs> yeah. there's so much. And like, if you're going to adapt your post for LinkedIn. And so I, I just, again, conceptually, I'm going to endorse the concept that content is a thing to, to, even if you're an ignorance on fire or I call it a ready fire aim entrepreneur type, <laughs> it's really one thing that it's worth doing some homework on and being okay. organized. And can I just say too, thank you for that endorsement. Too, yeah, Jeff, of course. Is well, it's just my opinion. <laughs> I sort of liken it to health and fitness. Like you can't, it's just a process and it's ongoing. Like you don't do marketing once and be done with it. It's, it's an ever going, you know, growing process. And it's like, start with what you're good at or where you're most comfortable, test it, tweak it. And then you add a channel or a platform or, you know, a content type. I, I just, this whole idea that you have to know everything right off the bat is ridiculous ridiculous it, it's just you have I, I go in where you're good and measure it and test it and tweak it you know there's always going to be another platform another strategy another tactic that you can try there will always be something else but um you need to focus <laughs> yeah I, I totally agree and and you know for me in operating in the absence of this planner but you know anybody that's in my world can say yeah jeff has a pretty mature efficient or at least effective. I don't know how efficient is content game. Like I, I, cr I produce a lot. I would say I'm, I'm simultaneous. Now after two years, I am strategic and consistent and probably close to prolific, but it was two years of just like pulling my hair out and 
and clawing my nails out and, and I have a team now and it's like, I've learned all this stuff and, you know, I've learned what happens when you export from Camtasia and try to import into Premiere and try to <laughs> overlay it with, you know, the export the transcription file and like, oh, it's, it's crazy. But here's the thing. It's also a free way to blow up a business and or it's a, it's a free way to brew your own gasoline to pour on the fire of any paid advertising that you're doing. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people resist content marketing because it sounds hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, can we all agree that it sounds hard because it is? <laughs> yeah, you yes. need to do the work. <laughs> like when you say, what would easy look like when it comes to actually creating and distributing content? I don't know what easy looks like for that. But well, you start, you sit down and you start. That's well, yeah, easy. <laughs> exactly. Hard, hard. I know what hard looks like, which is yeah. hemming and hawing and delaying and fretting and procrastinating and, and buying more courses and yeah, and, and being filled <laughs> over time with regret. But um, I don't know that there's easy, but I do think, and again, I'm not like, I didn't set out to just be like, Hey, come on my show so I can, you know, tell everyone that they, they need what you offer. But I mean, we're, we're not going to argue with you. Well, it, it, yeah, I, I mean, the reality is, it's yeah, it's hard, but what else can you do to create an exponential steroid-like growth effect on any business anywhere in the world that, that scales, and not only does it scale without friction, it actually, friction reduces the more it scales. I always We're totally going to take that clip and use that chat. No, but, and what else can you do to grow a business that way? I mean, yeah. I've grown my business 1700% in the last six months because I spent a year and a half figuring out how to do content really well. There's nothing else like that. So, you know, I, I don't know if you guys ever need help convincing people that like content <laughs> is really damn important, but feel free to use what I just said. And I'm no. saying it for my audience. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can't put this off anymore. No. Uh, that's great. And, you know, I just want to say something to your point about, you know, that this content stuff is hard and it's true. It's, it's hard and it's a lot of work, but often we make it so much harder than it has to be. Like the scenario that you described when you first got started and, you know, it was that chaos, right. you know, our, our planner is really a, a strategy and a tool. So it helps you create order and it helps you be strategic so that you're doing things logically and in an ordered fashion. And I think, you know, simple plans work because simple plans get followed. The more yeah. complexity we add to it, the more likely we are to abandon it. And, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to be simple and easy. I'm not trying to make this sound all unicorns and rainbows. It is a lot of work, but if you really just start with a goal, and determine what tactics you're going to take to accomplish that goal. And you define your offer, you understand who your audience is, you craft some messaging, write some content that's going to drive people into your offer funnel. That's it. The rest is just promoting that content, but we make it so much harder by trying to do a million things at once. And if you start with like one video, don't just, riff unless you're really good at riffing like plan out what you're going to say mm -hmm. use a teleprompter if you have to i sometimes have to do that <clears throat> kim kim's better at being off the cuff i, I like paralyze and freeze <laughs> but you know plan what you're going to say make your video extract the transcript from your video edit that a little bit now it's a blog post create some clips from it now it's social media content take some juicy quotes that you said you know, make some social media graphics out of that and put it into an evergreen funnel, put it into an ad and, you know, that, that can make money for 12 months <laughs> if yeah. it was good. I, I think we just, mm -hmm. sometimes we make it harder than it has to be. And sometimes it's so much chaos that we don't start because it's like yeah. the whole eating the elephant thing. Where do you start? Yeah, it's, um, I lost my train of thought, but because I'm, I'm just like, so I'm, you guys are giving me this like massive case of nostalgia. I'm reliving <laughs> the last two years thinking to myself, and I know what I was going to say, but I'm thinking like, man, what would it have been like to have this plan or just to have any plan? 
You know, the number one thing I've learned is if you want to simplify and accelerate getting a result, reduce the amount of research that's required and reduce either the number of or the time to make decisions. Mm -hmm. If right. the decisions are made for you and the research is already done so that it, so you can, it can just be explained to you why you should do something. Mm -hmm. So you can like scratch that itch of like, well, why am I doing this? You can go so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, it feels kind of like that's what your planner's done is it's like, listen, you're, you have to come up with the actual idea for the content, but from there, here's, here's how you apply it to all these different contexts. And here's the method for how you extract what you need from one thing to get what you need for the next thing. So you don't have to go research and figure out like the, the aspect ratio of an Instagram story post versus a Facebook <laughs> feed post or, you know, you, people don't have to figure that stuff out and they don't have to make the decisions about like, well, what should I do and why should I do it? Is it fair to say that that's kind of what you've done for people with your planner? The, the planner kind of not so much. I wouldn't say with that piece, like the sizes of the images and whatnot, but it's basically saying your content should support your business goals. So you're going to start with your business goals. What's the content you can create to support that? Where do you pull in the call to action and what are you selling? So the goal is nice. to start with, that's it. That, that's our monthly campaign strategy. You start with that. And from there you go, okay, now let's drill deeper. So I said I could create this content. Is it going to be a blog post? Is it going to be a video? Is it a podcast? And then you go, okay, I'm going to do each of those. What's the micro content? And then you drop that in, right? And then from there, you've got a monthly calendar where you know, we really look at the monthly campaign piece of it in terms of what's happening in your business. Do you have a sale this Friday? Are you doing a live stream? So you're gonna put all right. of that on your monthly. And then the weekly, you literally go down. What am I publishing and where is it going every day, mm -hmm. right? And then we have monthly and quarterly you, statistics. You've got to measure what, you know, the, the email marketing, the traffic, the blog posts and stuff. So, you know, it's, I, I think of it more as this is a framework mm -hmm. that is going to walk you through is a, is your content supporting your business goals and B, what are you doing now to, to get that out into the marketplace? I, mm -hmm. I uh, go ahead, Jody. I was just going to add that while we didn't include like the image sizes and formats, yeah, we and that's, a, two that's a super granular nitty gritty mm -hmm. thing. That's maybe not a great yeah. example of what I was talking about. Well, it's a valid point though. We do have a two page spread that we call content checklists for all the different forms of primary content, whether it's podcast, video, blog posts, some yeah. um, stories, things like that. Um, we, we do provide checklists of all the things, you know, that you want to make sure that okay. you've accounted for, for each one of those. And, you know, it made me think, oh, should we add the sizes? But that's something that changes with yeah. enough frequency that with a printed book, I, I'm a little hesitant. Yeah. Well, it, it, the, the main thing you, you said that I, I, I like and was kind of what I was looking for is like, you guys aren't just giving people a tool out of context. You're actually, because, you know, the three of us, we take for granted, this is how content is meant to function within your business. This is the broader marketing strategy this is the the functionality of different elements of the funnel and you know we just that's our world right but to the average person you give them a content planner without at least some basic education of like even how to be a marketer how to think of their business as a marketing project not a service and fulfillment project it was like your yeah. average attorney they know what they know. Like, I mean, they can tell you like, well, if you file this suit in the state of California, you're going to have your first hearing in 60 days. Like they know the rules of that. They don't know the rules of like, well, what's the, what's the general function of an Instagram post versus a YouTube video? Exactly. And, well, and, and that's that what you guys are kind of have baked into the strategy, right? It is. And we're also trying to come back to, again, my 80 year old man comment is like, direct response marketing principles that you're going to be able to carry across to different platforms. And like the first 10 or 11 pages, I don't know off the top of my head, Jody, but are more education. We tell you how the nice. planner works. And then we have a fictitious business that we filled in sample pages. So you get to see how you go from this piece to this piece to this piece so that you understand, oh, this is how this all ties together. Right? So yeah. I think the first 10, 11 pages are, are essentially education. Yeah, you know, maybe something that we should add in those front pages just kind of came <laughs> to me is, 
you know, something about which channels you should use. And the answer is Context. always which mm -hmm. channels is your audience using? If your audience is, you know, mm -hmm. a bunch of 50 to 60 year olds, well, they're on Facebook. If they're, you know, 20 to 35 year olds, there's fewer of them on Facebook, but they're still there because they have to use groups for various things right. that, you know, they're involved in. So, you know, use the channel where your audience already is because it's much easier to reach them where they already are than to bring them, you know, to, to, to where you prefer to be. Else, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's really important to be said. And, and, and obviously you guys can probably kind of feel this, that my intent for this episode is to make it so that, you know, obviously if somebody goes, I got to have that planner, I want them to buy it. And I want you guys, yeah, I'll ask you in a minute, like to tell them where to go and how to do it. But also, I'm, I'm, my intention is if somebody listens to this episode, even if they don't get the planner, they're still getting an education and they're still mm -hmm. getting some perspective on both, you know, starting and running an online business and also the content, you know, ultimately what your business addresses, which is content marketing and strategy. But I think that, so I'm really glad you just said what you said, because I think a lot, you know, the primary social media business influencers in the world right now are, you know, it's Gary Vee there's kind of like, it's like Gary Vee at the top of that hill. And then just below him is probably like Grant Cardone, maybe Dan Locke, um, just cause he's so voluminous, uh, maybe Patrick Bet David. I mean, there's, there's kind of this pantheon of people, Ty Lopez of people that are like, they embody how to use social media for business. But the problem, as you alluded to, is that they have big teams. Mm -hmm. And so you have like Gary Vee out there going like, TikTok, TikTok, that's the new hot thing. That's where you can grow the, you know, you can get the most organic traction. But the reality is, and this is what I found is like, I dabbled with TikTok and then I'm like, I don't, I'm, that's not my audience. I don't have the bandwidth. Yeah. And frankly, my, I don't. Not a good dancer, you know. No, I, I'm not. I don't, I honestly, I don't like it. I just personally dislike yeah. the platform. Yeah. It sounds like it's about, potentially about to get shut down anyway. So maybe I had yeah. some crystal ball there, but. You know, everybody doesn't need to do everything. And if you're getting your guidance from the Gary Vee's and the, the Grant Cardone's of the world, they're, they're omnipresent. That's their strategy. But you got to remember, Gary Vee runs a, a, a Fortune 500 marketing agency. Mm -hmm. So he's, his customers, he's not actually trying to market to his customers. He's trying to market to his customers' customers Mm -hmm. So that he can show his customers that he knows how to reach their customers better than they do. And, you know, there's he, and yet, so from that, he has to say, well, eventually I'm going to have a customer that is the right fit for TikTok. So I need to show them that I'm the expert on TikTok. And mm -hmm. I'm going to have a customer that is the right fit for Snapchat. So I need to show them that I'm the right fit for Snapchat and I'm the right fit for like, so he has to be a master of all of these things. Right. But like you, the listener or you, the business owner, you probably don't. And I think that's part of what creates the, uh, the paralyzing feeling of overwhelm, right? Is that people think they have to do it all. And the reality is that they can just pick one thing mm -hmm. and do it well and be light years ahead. That's I think it, Seth because... Godin is a great example of yeah. that. <laughs> Who? Seth Godin. He yeah. publishes a blog every day, sends it out by email. It's like two it's paragraphs. Also, <laughs> yeah. I mean, occasionally there's a longer one, but... He's not active on Facebook. He's not active on Twitter. He's not active anywhere. Is he still using TypePad even for his blog? I, I probably. <laughs> but his team does, you know, broadcast out the post right. to, you know, some other channels, but it's not him. You know, he, he writes the blog and he puts it out by email. And that's his one thing. And, you know, Austin Cleon, he's the Steal Like an Artist guy. He sends mm -hmm. out an email newsletter every Friday. And he posts in his blog. He used to use Tumblr and he's mm -hmm. active on Twitter. And that's it. He doesn't like Facebook. I'm sure he has a Facebook page, but you know, he's right. not active there. And I mean, these people are wildly successful. I mean, they're not selling coaching and high ticket services and stuff. Although Seth Godin certainly is selling high ticket stuff. But, yeah. Um, I mean, you just have to do what's right for your audience and works for you. Like I, I don't enjoy Twitter. So I have a Twitter account. I'm sure I have a few thousand followers. I don't pay any attention to it. <laughs> this is not, I'm not into it. Yeah. So um, you have to do what works for your audience and for you. I mean, we can't do all those things. Yeah. So uh, I mentioned it. Now I'll, I'll go right to it. How do people get this planner? Where, where do they go to yeah, discover this thing? 
Uh, website's the best spot, contentcreatorsplanner.com. <laughs> okay. Um, and they go there. I, and I'm actually, I'm asking like I don't know, but I totally know because I'm looking at it <laughs> on my other screen. Um, yeah, and it, and it displays it, it explains it. Obviously, it offers it. Um, and I noticed you have training. Uh, you have a quick start guide on there. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, yeah. It's a hefty post that goes through the entire process also. And so we've got the quick start guide. I mean, we have a lot of content on the site, free content mm -hmm. that'll help people, you know. And, and so there's, there's definitely plenty to get on the site from us um, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, there's three formats of the planner too. So we have a printed book, we have a digital, which is a PDF that you can print out yourself and you can use it on a, like an iPad with a stylus. Mm -hmm. That's, we like using it that way. And we have a Trello version for, that's great for collaborating with others. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I'm looking at it. Um, we our our company, we use, we use Trello in our content team actually migrated to Monday because it, oh, but it, that was, you know, we have 12 people all around the world now. Like we got a long way with Trello before mm -hmm. we, we ever switched to Monday. And even that was only because it had some Zapier automation stuff that it offered that Trello didn't, but. Um, people told us they wanted Trello. That's the only reason we made it. Yeah. And then we've been asked for like three other platforms. Asana's next. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've used Asana. I've used Trello. I've used Monday. Those are actually the, I guess the three main ones I've used. And uh, they're, they all are good for different things, but I can totally see that for the, again, I did all this without any sort of plan. I was just working out of Google Docs when I started, which is a mess, but I'm like, man, if I, if I had, if I had a structured way to organize this within Trello from day one, it would have been so much better. Um, well, let, so how about as far as following the two of you personally, do you guys do a lot of social promotion or, I mean, you're content creators, right? So yeah, uh, I have my personal brand too. Yeah, I, everywhere on social, I'm just Kim Doyle. Yeah, I'm pretty and that's Doyle like Royal, but with a D. Exactly. <laughs> and same, same for me. I'm on all the social channels as Jody Hirsch, which is J-O-D-I-H-E-R-S-H, like Hershey bar. Perfect. We do share content creator stuff on our personal as well. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Well, well, awesome. This has been wonderful. Um, I honestly, I have a million more questions, but I also have another interview in 13 minutes <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> that, that I should prep for, but, um, yeah, this has been tremendous. And, and I would, frankly, I would say expect to see an order coming through with my name on it because, um, a, I probably need it and B I'm just fascinated by it to go just to, to relive the, man, what would life have been like if I bought this two years ago? Um, that's awesome i'm totally so, gonna pull clips from this and we'll let you know <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and we'll t we can talk you have to another, cue yeah. that flashback music right yeah. here <laughs> well we can talk another time but listen yeah. i mean i've i've got a lot of probably relevant experience here for what you guys are doing so uh thanks for being guests on millionaire secrets this has been super informative this has been great thank you so much for yeah, having this was me great. of thanks. course and and to our millionaire secrets audience out there thank you as always listen Get your content game together. I, I usually try to be soft and I try to be politically correct. And I try to, <laughs> I try to uh, you know, pre-account for everybody's excuses and their own resistance, but I'm tired of it. No more BS. Con it's content or irrelevance for most Ooh. people. So nice. go check these ladies out. Thanks again, guys. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.